Hey, we're out here on the back porch today in this wonderful light and beautiful temperatures of North Carolina to open a box. And in the box is a 1927 Martin Handcraft tenor saxophone. Welcome to Hacka Week. So I finished up that Holton alto saxophone. I really, really enjoyed doing the restoration on that and all the tech work and learned a lot on the way and met some cool people on some forums and they gave me some great advice and then I decided I wanted a tenor. And of course, you know, I kind of was looking for the lost puppy because <laughs> I like fixing these things and I found this total gem of a buy. It was in Arizona, got it for a really good deal it's a 1927 Martin Handcraft tenor saxophone. They did these from, let's see if I remember right, 1914 to 1919 was the phase one uh, Martin tenor handcrafts, and then from 1919 to 1928 was the phase two Martin handcrafts, that's what I have, and this one is a 1927. And it's I would say maybe about 70% restored. The gentleman that had it before me got it from a man who got it from his grandfather who used to play it in a band in Arizona in the 30s. So how cool is that? I am, I guess, technically the, what, the fourth owner? Something like that. So it's partially put together. It's got some new pads with it and some other goodies and so Let's just get right to it. We're going to open the box it came in and get started. Okay, let's start pulling some stuff out of here. I saw this booklet in there. It's a book about jazz. I guess it probably came with the sax that he got from the guy that he bought it from. So, okay, that's kind of cool because I love jazz and jazz history. I've watched Ken Burns' jazz documentary like five times. I never tire of watching it, so I've got all kinds of packing material here to deal with, but that's okay. Let's just get it all out of the box first and then we'll clean up the mess. Gotta watch the springs. There's some exposed springs, so I don't want to poke myself with a spring. That would just be more blood. There it is. Oh my goodness, it's pretty. Wow. Love the color. I'm thinking that this has been re-lacquered at least once. It sure looks like it. I think it's original because, yeah, it's been re-lacquered. Because there's like tarnish under the lacquer. That just, you know, that doesn't happen. But uh, what I'm real curious about is this dent that I saw down here. Oh, it's been fixed. Okay. It's been pushed out a bit. Not in the best way, but... It's not as bad as I thought it was from the original pictures I saw. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. I'm probably not going to do much with that. I'm just going to leave it alone because I don't really think it's going to affect the playability much. Um, there's a couple little places where there's a little bit of pitting. No green stuff, no verdigris going on. It's got roux pads on it. Roux meaning as in kangaroo skin pads. They definitely need to be worked a little just already i'm seeing that they're not really seeding the way they're supposed to at all so it's going to need a bit of work but hey you know the guy that worked on it he tried i don't think he ever did anything like this before which he mentioned to me so i'm probably going to end up taking this all apart again right down to the body and more or less starting over so, the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece was an interesting curiosity. And uh, my buddy on, that I met on Sax on the Web Forum looked at this and he said, Hmm, that looks to me like it might be a lion and Healy. Sure enough, it is. You know your mouthpieces, my friend. Right there. It's a lion and Healy mouthpiece and potentially worth more than I paid for this entire saxophone. So that is really cool to have in this package, I must say. How about that? That's way cool. Bonus. So here we are on the bench with this Martin handcraft and the upper stack is on and 
this is all of the pieces for the lower stack. What I want to do, the plan here is I'm just going to put things together even if it's a little rough just to make sure I've got all the parts and then what we're going to do is completely disassemble the entire instrument and I'm seriously considering, in fact I think I am just definitely going to do this, I'm going to strip everything of all of the existing lacquer. Someone has re-lacquered this and they did it in such a way where there's some tarnish underneath the lacquer or the clear coat of whatever type it is. I'm not even sure it's lacquer. Um, it could be urethane, it could be enamel, but it feels heavy to me. It doesn't feel like real lacquer. Um, I don't know what it is, but it was obviously put on over the top of some tarnish. You can see it on the keys. I can scrape away some of it where it was put on over the top of some uh, tarnished brass so it wasn't really done right but the first step is going to be to take all of this put it together that'll get me familiar with the instrument as well well the good news is all the parts are there the lower stack is all back on everything is in place however there's a lot of key straightening to do and um, pretty much need to pull all the cork off that was put on because it was put on improperly and too thick this is as far closed as I can push the keys because Things are binding up. Uh, also, the pads aren't striking the way they should. For instance, right here, it's hitting at the heel of the pad. It won't even close all the way. Same thing here, won't close all the way. There's just way too much cork put on a lot of things. In fact, I couldn't even put the octave mechanism together because there was so much cork on all of this stuff right here. I peeled off some cork just so I could assemble the thing. But um, the lower stacks together, all of this I got back together, which was a bit of a challenge. I did have some pictures to work from that I had found on the interwebs, but that was a bit tricky. There is a certain way and order that it all has to go together, and uh, you have to follow that order. That's the only way it'll go. So. All right, so now what's next? What's next is to take it all back apart, keep track of all the parts, pull all the pads from the key cups uh, with the heat gun, set them all aside um, somewhere where they'll be safe, and then we're gonna get started on basically stripping everything off from this. Now this I'm gonna do with the hot air gun, warm up the cup, and very carefully get in here on the corner with my little pin vise that I homemade one, made from an old spring and a dowel, pretty easy to make. Warm this up enough where I can gently pry this out. I'm gonna try to do it without poking a hole in the pad and they should come out easy and they do. So uh, that's one. All the pads are removed and there is a big old pile of keys. So I just tried a little experiment with some paint stripper on this to get the old lacquer off and it worked pretty well. Lacquer or whatever it was, I guess it was probably lacquer. It came off fairly easy with just some spray on paint stripper. So the next step is to do that to every single inch of this saxophone, all the brass. I'm going to strip it all and now I'm thinking I may just go ahead and leave it bare brass when I'm all done. I get everything laid out here with two coats of spray-on stripper applied to everything. And I tested it on one piece. It works pretty well. It takes all the stuff off. So I'm going to let this sit for several more minutes. And then uh, give it a rinse in some hot water. Scrub it a little bit with a brush and we should have all that old lacquer stuff off. Anything that doesn't come off I can go back and wipe it with a little acetone and then we'll get down to uh, probably the next step will be putting everything together and setting the inherent adjustment on all the keys getting everything straightened out and we can move on from there back on the bench stripped still a little cleanup to do here and there but took off about 90 percent of the lacquer probably more than that all the keys were over here drying off that was quite a process and of course while I'm at it I'm going to check the cups for flatness on the bench anvil here and 
this one looks great any of them that do need to be straightened out if they're a little bent up I can just let it lean off the side give it just a light tap with the mallet so that's the before and there we go after a little rework with a socket and the mallet and a little bit of polishing with some steel wool to get the crud off we are back to a nice round key okay there it is it's heavier now um, and it's all back together enough to check the key heights it took me about uh, roughly an hour maybe a little bit less so what we're after here is to have this cup nice and parallel with this tone hole as per the thickness of the pads that I'm putting on. So first I just want to show you what I'm talking about here on the inherent height and being parallel. So if I bring this down nice and tight, I've got the leak light inside. You can see that between the key cup and the actual tone hole there's a nice clean parallel line going on you want that to look that way from a 360 degree view all the way around and with the pads I'm using I'm after maybe about two millimeters of height away from that tone hole on the bottom of the cup right now it's a little bit high that's a little bit low and you can kind of see the back of the cup if I push it down to where it just disappears and we look at the tone hole that's nice and parallel and it's about the right height that I want it I'm gonna put a pad in there now and show you about how high it's going to be with a pad in it so I'm gonna insert one of my roux pads in here and it's gonna have a minimal amount of shellac on it when I set the pad but if I push this down right now with no shellac or anything you can see that it's pretty darn parallel if anything over here to this side there's a little bit of light that shows up before this side and that could totally be taken care of with shellac there is a little bit of shellac on the back of this pad right now which could be throwing it off just a tiny bit the inherent key adjustment is all done so we are now ready to take this all back apart one more time why because I have a couple of springs I need to replace and I also need to adjust a few springs uh, that are loose get them seated better in their posts so it's all gonna come back apart now there we go completely disassembled in about 10 minutes it doesn't take long to take one apart Putting them back together takes a while and then adjusting everything after you put it together takes another quite a while so uh, there's a lot to it. So I was going to try buffing all the keys and everything out with a tiny little buffing wheel on my Dremel and I tried it and you know all it really does is put scratches in the brass and I don't need to do that much. I've gone over this with a wool cloth piece of wool I think this is wool it might be cotton but I'm pretty sure it's wool uh, at any rate it works really well for an initial polishing with good old brasso and once I get that part of it done by hand then I'm following up with some never dull and I may even come back for a third pass uh, third and final with wean all gotta go buy some of that but that stuff's great I've used it on plastics and chrome and it's really good stuff so if I get after this with a little bit of never dull and then just follow up with a final wipe with just a good old cotton t-shirt to get off the excess stuff and then we'll switch over to a jeweler's um, polishing rag it's got some it's impregnated basically on the red side with jewelers rouge it gets on your hands I use this on jewelry it works quite well I'm going to just do one side of this so you can kind of see the difference of a before and after we do it with the red side first and then finish up with the yellow side and there you go there's the side that was done 
with the jeweler's cloth and that's just finishing up with cotton after the um, never dull but I can get it even better than that if I follow up once more with some wean all but anyway whole thing is going to be done by hand so I got a lot of work ahead of me a lot of hours of sitting here polishing which is actually kind of a labor of love in a way it's kind of fun well about two and a half hours later and we have all of the keys and levers and parts polished up nicely the neck is all done I even put in the first pad the octave key pad but everything looks really great came out very nice I got the spring cut to length it's a 1.2 millimeter diameter and now that I think about it there's no sense putting it in right now because I need to do all this polishing and I need to deal with all these other pointy bits that want to bite my ass so uh, I'm gonna leave that spring out for now and do all the polishing first but I've got myself protected from the pokey bits now. All the way around, all the little red points are places to watch out for. So now it's time to get after polishing the entire horn. Getting after this now with Haggerty 100 metal polish. Um, someone on the Sacks on the web forum told me about this stuff good stuff. Um, it does a nice final polish on everything. And I've got this on a big wooden dowel to kind of help with doing it this way. In the final stage now with the uh, jeweler's polishing cloth, got red jeweler's rouge impregnated on one side, the polishing cloth on the other. This is the same one I used when I made uh, the wedding rings. For my wife and I over five years ago it's a beautiful thing nicely polished wow what a difference so now we're ready to move on to getting the pads ready time to put the shellac back on the pads got the little pin vise here holding the shellac a couple fingers underneath it Let's warm up the shellac with the heat gun just to the point that it melts a little bit. I don't want to be like the last time where there was way too much. Just want a nice even layer across the back. And then I'm going to take the whole thing after the bubble stop here. Push it down onto the bench anvil. Nice and flat. That rivet's hot, I can tell you that. Hello. That's it. That's what we want on all the pads, just a nice even coat. Before I tackle those springs, I thought I would check tone hole levelness. This has soldered on tone holes kind of like the uh, Holton, except they're really thick on the Martin. On the first uh, three versions of the early Martins, these are really thickly made and they are soldered on. And they are prone to corrosion around here. Galvanic reactions happen between the lead and the brass. And once moisture gets in, it's like a battery in there. And you get basically a, uh, a corrosion going on and it can separate from the body and it can leak there but this little gap of light you see right there that's that's not a flat tone hole you would think that these would be really flat because they are really solid but this thing is uh, a 1927 saxophone so it's not too surprising that it's had a little changes in its metallurgy over time i've got a piece of brass here that I have a piece of sticky back adhesive paper on. This is about 120 grit, I think. And I've found this is a pretty easy way to level out tone holes. There's numerous ways. People do it with a file. You can buy the tone hole files like I uh, made myself uh, that I used on the Holton. That's in another video. But I like this because I can just take a look at where the light is leaking out and that's a low spot 
And of course, on the other side of the tone hole is the high spot. And I know this is nice and flat because I can move it around different ways and we still see that same gap no matter which way I put it. So that tells me that the metal is nice and flat. So what I can do is just put this in with the adhesive side down and pretty much just sand with pressure on the high side. Kind of stay away from the side where the leak is because I'm after taking metal off from the other side. And if I just stay at it, it takes a little time impatience but I can slowly get it leveled out a little at a time that leak will get less and less this one's a little tricky because it has the wire key guard around it so it's not too easy to uh, slide this back and forth and move it but I can see that I am actually taking away metal on this side and I can also see that this side is low a little bit of corrosion has happened here it's at the bottom of the the bow here so of course that would uh, be the spot where it's going to get the most corrosion going on because that's where the moisture builds up so I'm just going to keep at it until I get all of these leveled out. All right finally on to the spring work I've got a few springs that are loose I've got one that's missing right there right there and uh, I have cut it earlier and now I need to anneal the end of it that means heat it up with a torch and then smash it flat with a hammer and then we're going to set it in that hole right there. First, let's anneal it. Just until you see the bluing go away. Next, we're going to flatten the end with a hammer. And that flattened part is what's going to go in the hole and keep it stuck in there. Okay, let's get the spring in the post. I've got my homemade spring pliers. They got a slot in this end to accommodate the spring on this side, and then we push with this side. I'm just going to squeeze to fix that into the post. There we go, that one is done. Now, what I'm going to do is go through all the springs, check them out, and um, tighten up any that are loose. Okay, springs are all set. We're ready to start putting things back together. And I have the pads and I have the keys, the key cups. What I want to do is get these initially seated in here. They've got shellac on them all the way around. And um, later when it's on the instrument, I will actually seat them in fully. But for right now, what I want to do is just pop them in there warm up the center a little bit and then just give the center only a push to just seat them into the center portion only. So let's get the heat gun out. I'm going to warm it right in the middle and then I'm going to warm the pad in the middle only. Just get this shellac a little bit melted right in the very middle. And then I'm just going to drop it in there and give it a push. Middle only. So now it's stuck. It, it's in there and it's stuck. And then the rest of it will warm up and stick in there later. So I'll go through and do this to all of the pads now and the uh, keys that go with them. We are ready to put the keys back on. And uh, along the way we're going to do some recorking on sections of the keys. And, um, well, we're just going to time lapse this. Here we go.
Okay, some of the detail you did not see in that quickie little segment is all of the cork that has to go on for the proper regulation. There's little pieces of cork all over the place. You can see them right there. There's also some underneath the keys right there and the bottom of them. See that? There's some between this bar here and the key foot there. It's all over the place and it's critical that it's all adjusted. That's what I'm about to do next so that when I press on these keys things actually do what they're supposed to do. For instance, I'm going to push down on this key. You can see other keys follow suit but the heights of them are considerably different. I can adjust this. Of course the pads are not seated yet. So that's the next thing to do. Warm up these key cups and get the pads seated with no leaks. So we'll start right here with this one. Just gonna give it a gentle push down and warm up the cup. Simple as that until I see things settle down a bit, which means that the shellac has gotten hot enough to melt. And the other thing I can do is put in this putty knife, basically, taking the place of a... And what the putty knife will do is give me a nice flat surface to push against instead of the tone hole. There are special... go. I can see shellac squishing out over on this side, which I can clean up later. After it hardens, it just chips away. And that's it. Got the bottom section done. Check for light leak. Everything looks good. No light leaks on any of the keys. Got a nice action. They all close the way they're supposed to. They're regulated, in other words. And we're good. So while I'm waiting for my reeds to get here, I'm going to let this sit for a couple days with uh, every single one of the keys closed and leave a little pressure on them. I'm just going to use some cloth to tie these closed. I've got everything tied off with some cloth. All the keys are closed. I'm just going to leave it like that for a couple days and uh, while that's happening I am working on re-corking the neck where the mouthpiece goes on. And I apply some adhesive to this. I've got a piece over there with adhesive on it drying. And we're going to put new cork on this neck. Okay, this is thoroughly dry. It's actually been drying for a couple of days. I'm just going to slice this top layer only at an angle. Just stay flush along the layer below it but not cutting into that layer and I end up with something like that. Now I need to sand it. Got a piece of 100 grit and I'm just going to start getting rid of that lump until it gets round in that area. Stop and take a look at it here. That actually looks pretty good. Let's do a trial fit on the mouthpiece. Gosh, that's that's not bad right where it's at. I might just uh, give it a little bit more of a cleanup and call it good. And I'm going to say that that's done. By the time I get cork grease on there, that'll push on there just enough. Well, 
I love it. It's going to take a little getting used to. It's bigger. The fingering's a little different because of where your hands go on a tenor versus that little alto. But I think this is the start of a beautiful friendship. So I guess that's a wrap. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Give it a thumbs up. And until next time, or should I say, till next instrument. <laughs>